Hey, what's going on everybody? This is Jared here with another video. This one's going to be reviewing the 2023 Coke Zero Sugar 400. Now, this is a race my mom and I went to the other day and a lot happened and I just wanted to review the whole thing from start to finish and give you my thoughts and analyzations on things. So let's go ahead and get started. We got to the track about five to six hours early just so we had plenty of time to like, you know, just take our time and do everything that we wanted and, you know, just kind of check everything out. And one of the first things we did was we went to like where the Daytona experience is, where like the ticket office basically. My first time being inside there in a long time. And I wanted to check out the gift shop because I knew they had some die cast in there. And they actually had a decent amount of die cast. Uh, they had a lot of 124s and they had a decent amount of 164s. Uh, the only negative though I would say about the die cast is they were extremely expensive. Like it was absolutely insane, but I guess that's kind of how it is nowadays. I, uh, saw the wall of 164s and I was like, okay, well there's a few in here that I, I would, I, you know, wouldn't mind getting. So I grabbed a few off the shelf and then I didn't even look at the price, but I saw the price when I got to the register and it was ridiculous that each each 164 is $15 yeah I'm just like damn I gotta be like super selective when I go to the merchandise trailers later and um yeah it was just wild I'm in my next video I'm gonna show you all the die casts that I got from the race and after we did the gift shop we uh decided to go to tweet up now tweet up is like this gathering that Jeff Gluck and Bob Hockris do of Twitter users at the NASCAR races every single weekend. And back in the day, I used to go to this every single year. I met some great guests. Um, they had Trevor Bain, they had Bobby Allison, Train. Yeah, fucking Train. It's always interesting to see if they're gonna have any guests or not, you know, and if they don't, that's totally fine. You know, you still got all these NASCAR fans to, you know, socialize with and whatnot and get to see Jeff Gluck and Bob Hockris and got to, you know, you get to talk to them and everything. So we go there and unfortunately there are no guests, but the cool thing was I actually saw my buddy Dalton who works for frontstretch.com and he was actually um, helping them with the tweet up and you know, <clears throat> socializing with some of the fans and whatnot. So I actually got to catch up with him and uh, introduce him to my mom and everything. So that was really cool. We talked for a really long time about numerous things NASCAR related and it was just great, great catching up with him and great talking to him. and. Um, just uh, one of the highlights of the whole day, to be honest. So after we did the tweet up for the first time in years, we headed over to the merchandise trailers. And as I said, I had to be more selective because I'm already like in the hole from the fucking gift shop. So I uh, definitely made it a point to be more selective, checked out the trailers and uh, the die casts were slightly cheaper at these trailers. I would say the 164s were, most of them were like $12 at each trailer. Um, some, some trailers were a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, but most of them are around $12. Now let me back up to the gift shop just for two seconds. I wanted to mention how at the gift shop I actually saw the Eric Jones Guns N' Roses 164. Now, <laughs> he ran this car at the Daytona 500, and if you know the channel, if you know me, Guns N' Roses is my favorite band of all time, so to see that car randomly run at the Daytona 500 in person was a really surreal experience. With It felt like the stars aligned, and it was just really awesome. It was, a, it was a shame that he wrecked, but it was just such a cool experience that he got to run that. So right after that race, I immediately ordered the shirt, and I ordered the 164 and the 124. Now, the die casts were pre-orders, and they're supposed to ship, I believe, at the end of August. Now, something I realized, uh, I want to say a few weeks ago, I saw online that um, some people started, you know, getting their um, 164 Guns N' Roses cars, and I wasn't sure about the 124, but I saw that the 164 definitely, like, was out, and I still hadn't received mine. But anyway, I saw it at the gift shop, and I was like, well, that kind of sucks that it's at the gift shop, and this is kind of my first time seeing it in person. I didn't want to, like, overly analyze it, but it was kind of uh, disappointing that I'm still waiting on mine to come in the mail. Now, now let's go back to the trailers. So when we went to Eric Jones' trailer, I saw they once again had the 164 Guns N' Roses die cast, and um, I looked over, and I saw that um, people were waiting in line for an autograph session. And I looked at the whiteboard and it said he was going to be arriving in literally two minutes. And 
I was like, well, that's cool. I get to, you know, I'll get to see him and everything. Um, that'll be cool footage for the video. It'll be cool to see him in person and everything. So normally when it comes to these merchandise trailers, you have to get like a wristband or like a ticket in, in advance. And it's only like the first 150 people or whatever. And I've never really done any of these types of autograph signings. I remember one time Kurt Busch years ago did one of these and we kind of snuck in at the last second and just asked him, hey, can you sign this? We didn't have a wristband or anything. He was cool enough to sign it. Um, but I absolutely hate how they do these like wristbands and shit. It's like, I'm not gonna show up super early to get a wristband. But we asked the lady at the trailer and she was like, you know, anyone can get in line. You don't even need a wristband. So we were like, well, hell yeah, let's totally, you know, the line wasn't even that long. I mean, it's kind of wrapping around the trailer, but I mean, it's just a trailer. So we're like, let's definitely um, get in line. But I'm like, what the fuck am I gonna have them sign? So I'm like, <laughs> I'm wearing the fucking Guns N' Roses Eric Jones shirt. I'm not gonna take this shit off and have him sign it, especially because it's fucking hot out and I've been sweating and shit. Like, and I'm not gonna be shirtless. Like, what the fuck? I was like, all right, I'm just gonna bite the bullet and buy the fucking 164 diecast right here, even though mine still hasn't arrived. But I feel like it was just meant to be. So, bought the diecast and waited in line. And I, uh,. Had my mom record my experience with him so there's no need to really explain how the encounter went because i have the whole thing on video like i said and it's in my previous video so if you want to watch it you can um only thing i'll say is so on after we got the autograph i uh looked at the die cast and unfortunately he signed it in black sharpie now i don't know i don't know if he only had a black sharpie but that just, that was disappointing, I'm not gonna lie, because the car is mainly black, and I just, uh, I kind of wish he just would have taken that extra effort to, like, sign it in something else. Um, it's kind of hard to see, especially because it's a 164 diecast, so, like, autographing a 164 diecast in general is not the easiest. It is what it is. It was just cool to have that moment in general. So, we headed over to the one of the next trailers, and we went to one of the uh, generic NASCAR trailers where they sell a lot of like 75th anniversary merchandise and nothing really interesting in there to be honest but i looked over and i'm like oh shit michael mcdowell's doing an autograph signing and i'm like well i wonder if this is kind of the same deal where you could just get in line so i asked the person and they were like yeah you can just get in line i'm like well this is cool so this is i hope this is like a new thing they're doing they're just saying fuck the wristbands because i hate the wristbands so my next <laughs> obstacle was what, what the fuck am i gonna have him sign because i don't have anything so i was just kind of racking my brain and um, my mom ended up just saying like, I'm just going to buy this towel. So she bought this like random NASCAR 75th anniversary towel. And, uh, I, I ran around the trailer and I was like, damn, there's like no one in line. I, I went around the whole trailer and I look over and I'm like, holy shit, he's gone. I'm like, oh man, I wonder if I can like catch him like uh, on the back of the trailer, like getting in his golf cart or something. And, um, yeah, somebody was like encouraging me to do it too. So I ran around the back of the trailer and he was getting in his golf cart and I, I stopped him and I was like, you know, would you mind signing this? And he was super, super nice, smiling ear to ear. He just seemed so genuine and he signed that. And I'll show that in my next video. Also that autograph. I didn't get this encounter on video though. Um, but he was super nice, like pretty much the, the exact guy you always see on TV. And that was just, uh, that was just really cool. My encounter with him, I told him that it was nice getting to know him better um, over the last few weeks because he won two weeks ago, and I also congratulated him on that. And yeah, you know, with these encounters, I try to be like as genuine as possible and, uh, you know, just try to make it somewhat memorable and say something that I genuinely felt. So that was cool, and then he sped off, and um, someone else actually stopped him, and he stopped his golf cart to sign their stuff. So super cool, great experience with Michael McDowell. Um, Eric Jones ended up coming up in his golf cart, and uh, yeah, I'm not gonna sit here and like talk major shit about Eric Jones or anything, but he kind of gave off like he's too cool for school vibes. He just had his sunglasses on and didn't smile too much. Um, he kind of just seemed like, you know, he was there just because he had to be and um, not super interactive and kind of just like was <laughs> ready to get it over with, I guess you could say. And it was kind of the same thing when we like, <laughs> you know, said something to him on when he was passing by in his golf cart, you know, it didn't say much, didn't really, <laughs> didn't really do much, but you know, it is what it is. I'm not saying he's a complete asshole or anything like that, but I just felt like, um, it, it was definitely, you could tell that he wasn't super, super 
uh, approachable and like not a major personality, I guess you could say. All right, so with all that being said, um, we headed over to this one uh, uh, appearance. Um, Austin Dillon was doing an appearance at the Chevy stage. So we kind of listened to him talk for a few minutes and I pulled my phone out just to get some footage of that. And right as I pulled my phone out, this fan to my left actually started heckling him. Once again, I'm not gonna really get in depth in this. Just know that the fan was heckling him and Austin responded. So if you wanna see the video, check it out my last video. It is interesting. For sure, um, especially with Austin responding, it's like, damn, like I can't believe you're even like giving him the time of day. Um, kind of reminds me of like Kevin Durant, like you know the haters always get to the get to Kevin Durant's head, and Austin Dillon just seemed like he was not in the best mood, and he was just kind of kind of just negative, and it just seemed like he was kind of maybe in his own head. He's had a rough year. He's had a lot of rough years, to be honest, and uh, it was just a, a really interesting moment to say the least. So uh, right after that, Kyle Busch came on stage and he did uh, an appearance with Austin Dillon. And it was kind of interesting because it seemed like most fans were talking to Kyle after that and, you know, interacting with Kyle and asking him questions, not so much Austin. So Austin was kind of awkwardly sitting there. So then we uh, went ahead and headed to the stands and... This go round, we actually bought fan zone tickets along with our regular tickets. So we... Uh, we went ahead and uh, went through the fence area and went on the track. Now this is the first time I've done fan zone in about 12 years. It's been a really long time, but I really wanted to do something just to change it up. And I wanted to see the cars up close and everything. So it was, it was really cool experience just walking on the track and it just, it's crazy how like big the track is and you just feel so tiny and walking through the ball field and just fans everywhere, getting to see the cars up close. Um, getting pictures and videos of the cars and everything and then we headed into the actual infield and you don't get a ton of access I mean you get access to the actual fan zone area but there's a lot of like food and drinks and you know more there's another stage where drivers are doing appearances and stuff there's a merchandise trailer you can go on top of the garage area but you can't really go like in the in the garage area as far as next to the haulers and next to the garage area and all like the personnel that are walking by and whatnot you can't really get access to that because that's like i want to say that's cold that's a cold pass or a hot pass that's one of one of the two never gotten one of those but it's really cool if you get um like infield access to like the rolex you can get access to all that stuff like you can you can see the drivers walking past you and all that stuff it's really fucking cool but this is definitely more restricted, but it was cool standing on top of the garage area and kind of looking down um, to see this area that you're not, you don't have access to. Get to see a lot of big names like Kyle Larson, uh, Marty Snyder, Dave Burns. Uh, who else did we see? We saw Bob Pockris again. You just constantly, I mean, if you're a diehard NASCAR fan, you'll like, <laughs> you know, you'll recognize people left and right. And it was really cool to see and just pointing people out and whatnot. And then uh, at one point I saw um, Chris Busher just walking like in his street clothes and uh, not too many people recognized them. I think one person might've recognized them or that I saw, um, but he kind of just walked through the crowd and you know, uh, that was it. He was just kind of chill and low key. So that was cool. And then after that, we got some drinks. I got a video of the prices. Of course, they're astronomical, just ridiculous. I heard that at Talladega, it's like way cheaper. It's not even close to like the prices that you would see at like Daytona and I'm sure other tracks. So it is ridiculous. You know, you hate to see that price gouging, but you know, it is what it is. Once you're, once you're there, you kind of expect it and you can't let the the money get to you you know you're just trying to have a good time so after that we went back to the ball field and listened to the um the concert a little bit maybe a song or two and uh i've never even heard of this guy it was just some you know country act and i mean not to be disrespectful or anything but i never heard of this guy and i didn't particularly care for his performance um i'm also not really a country fan but you know, hopefully everyone else enjoyed it. And then after that, we checked out uh, the cars up close again because there are some more cars that were still being rolled out to the grid. Got to see uh, most of them. One thing I will say that is disappointing, though, is like pretty much like you get to see most of the cars, but there's also like a decent amount of cars that you don't get to see because 
they they kind of like just line up all the way out to like pit entry um past pit entry actually so it's kind of disappointing like i kind of wish they just like move shit over and um you were, you were able to see like all the cars up close uh i don't know why they do that um but i guess they're just trying to keep everything centered in the ball field but yeah just a little disappointing um yeah, and then we just kind of headed back to our seats. And as we were heading back to our seats, you have all these fans that are congregated on the start finish line, signing the start finish line. Got to see the the choose cone. Well, it's not a cone, but like the actual choose zone. I, sh I guess she's. I guess you could say. And then headed back up to our seats. Now our seats were pretty much as high as you could go next to like the Rolex section. Um, it wasn't exactly pit exit, but it was kind of like. I would say three quarters of the way down pit road on the other side. And uh, the view is always, we, we've gotten these seats numerous times. The view is very good. You can see the whole track. I like getting really high up seats when it comes to like NASCAR races. So you can really see the whole track. Eventually driver intro started and I thought it was interesting. Um, a few little tidbits. Bubba Wallace of course got booed, but he actually didn't get booed as, as bad as I thought he would. Um, I feel like he probably gets it way worse at other places maybe, but he still definitely got booze. It was interesting to hear Kyle Busch getting cheers. Now don't get me wrong, he didn't get a ton of cheers, but he definitely got like, he got a decent amount of cheers. And it's just interesting because, you know, in years past, he would always just get booed so loud. He was like the biggest, the biggest one when it came to booze. So it's just interesting how that's changed. He's, he kind of went from like a heel to like, I wouldn't say a hero, but like a likable heel, I guess you could say. Um, so anyway, National Anthem, I uh, thought was so bad. I, I was like, it was, uh, it was pretty cringe. It's just mind blowing that like, sometimes at these huge sporting events, they just still have like really bad singers. And um, yeah, there was no flyover or anything like that. Um, and then, yeah. Let's just go ahead and uh, talk about the race a little bit. Now, I know most people are probably like, well, why the fuck is it like taking this long to get to the race? Well, for me, I feel like going to a race, there's way more to talk about than just the race. It's a whole experience. So, yeah, it's like, of course, there's going to be a section for talking about the race, but a lot of it's just going to be like the before and after of, you know, everything that happened throughout the whole day for me personally. Um, I thought the race was solid. I didn't think the race was phenomenal i didn't think it uh was one of the best races i've ever seen i feel like um each manufacturer really shined at different points in the race like it started off with the fords and i feel like the toyotas took over and then i feel like the chevys um had their moment and then like the fords kind of came back and you know had their moment and overall um i feel like was the they were the best manufacturer throughout the whole night um you know I feel like with this car, it's really hard to make runs and uh, have a lot of passing. And there's a lot of just two by two and just not a ton of like drafting and, you know, slingshotting and stuff like that. It's just a lot of two by two. It's just like which, which lane has the most energy. And um, that can be frustrating at times, especially if like one lane is just dominating. I feel like um, both lanes definitely... Um, shined at different times it was interesting i can't remember which stage it was but there was at one point a lot of three by three action like there was a third lane forming and that was really entertaining to watch some of the drivers that uh that led some of the you know most laps in the race chase briscoe ross chastain uh you know martin truex was up there denny hamlin it was uh, definitely a mixed bag. A couple other things that happened during the race. Uh, out of nowhere, um, a rocket launch started happening from Cape Canaveral. So everyone was like watching that and watching the race at the same time. Some people were recording it. I know I was. Um, there were some fireworks going on over um, on Beach Street. Just a really interesting night with things happening left and right. I would say that the first major incident came at the end of stage two. Christopher Bell was pushing Ty Gibbs in the corner, coming off turn four for the end of the stage and uh, caused a huge wreck. Ryan Blaney wrecked really hard. I think it's uh, incredible how much the wall moved because he hit it head on. 
And honestly, it really reminded me of Dale Earnhardt's crash. And I actually heard someone else say they thought the same thing. So glad that he's okay. But that was a really bad lick. So after that wreck, I feel like stage three was pretty tame. Um, I feel like they kind of settled down. So the race kind of dwindled down to the last few laps. And uh, with a few laps to go, Ryan Priest spun out on the back stretch and he actually caught air and started flipping. And um, it was a really vicious wreck. It was incredible to see in person. Like it was just like really surreal. Honestly, the, I've, I've already used this word numerous times to other people, but it was disturbing. I'm not gonna lie. Just to see how high it was and just to see that car just twirling and flipping and it was just, it didn't seem real. It didn't look real. It was one of the worst wrecks I've ever seen in person. I'll never forget this wreck. Um, it was so weird how much air he caught. Like he was just so high up in the air and like, it just seemed like the car would just not stop like <laughs> bouncing. It just, it just kept twirling and kept flipping and it just uh, eventually came to rest and it was just shocking. And the whole crowd was just, you know, in shock. Um, but he got out and he was like, okay, um, as far as, you know, being awake and alert, but they had to put him on a stretcher, was, which was not a good sign. And uh, they ended up keeping him overnight at Halifax and he's okay. Absolutely vicious wreck. And he's had a few of them in his career, but that was, that was definitely the, uh, one of the moments that was super, super prominent about the whole night was that huge, you know, really vicious one car wreck by Ryan Priest. But after that Ryan Priest wreck, um, things got a lot more tame. It was a green white checker, overtime finish, and uh, it was really clean. It was really clean. I think that kind of, I think that kind of scared the field and they were just like, all right, we're not gonna wreck anymore. Like we're just gonna race to the finish as clean as we can. Brad Keselowski pushed his t RFK teammate, Chris Buescher out to the lead. And once he got the lead, I was like, okay, it's gonna be tough to, it's gonna be tough to um, beat Chris Buescher here. And, yeah, sure enough, he went and uh, took the win and uh, wasn't much of a fight behind him. And uh, yeah, this is his third win of the season, his breakout year. Absolutely insane. It was interesting because, like I said, um, we actually saw him walking around in the garage area before the race and not, not many people recognized him. So it's only a matter of time before Brad Keselowski gets a win. He's been knocking on the door for a long time. Bubba Wallace makes the playoffs. And uh, fans are booing, but, you know, I'm happy. He's my favorite driver. This was the first time ever that he's made the playoffs, so I'm really happy for, I'm really happy for him. And, you know, you could tell he was stressing. He was locked in, but uh, he got it. And uh, we'll see how he does in these playoffs coming up. So, yeah, the playoffs start next weekend, and it's going to be really interesting to see how these playoffs go and how the season ends. I'm going to be going to Homestead coming up in, I believe, in October. And yeah, that was my review for the 2023 Coke Zero Sugar 400. Been to this race a lot of times. Been to the 500 a lot of times. Definitely a memorable one for sure though. So I hope you all enjoyed. Please comment, like, subscribe, and I'll see you on the next one.